like at the end of the day, we know who we are at Attitude. We know what we like. We know what visuals resonate with us. Um, and that's who we want our audience to be. Hey everyone, this is Nazara Keel from Max Pro. Hi, I'm Linda. And I'm Paul. And we're Love and Pebbles. Hi, this is Lopa Vandermersch from Rasa. Oh, you're listening. And you're listening. And you are listening to the Ecom Show. Welcome to the Ecom Show, presented by Blue Tusker. The number one place to hear the inside scoop from other e-commerce experts, where they share their secrets on how they scaled their business and are now living the dream. Now, here is your host, Andrew Mapp. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Ecom Show. I'm your host, Andrew Mapp, and today I am joined by the amazing Chelsea Schultz of Etitude, who is the uh, Director of Performance Marketing there. Super excited to dig into this one. Chelsea, you ready for a good show? I am so excited to be here. This is going to be awesome. I love your whole role and everything you're all about. So um, this is going to, we're going to end up nerding out on <laughs> data analytics and, and marketing, and this is going to be fantastic. But before we uh, end up going down that road, why don't I give you an opportunity here, let everyone know, uh, you know, a little bit more about your background, who you are, what your role is at Attitude, and we'll kind of take it from there. Yeah, awesome. So I am Chelsea Schultz. I am the Director of Performance Marketing at Attitude. Brief intro of Attitude. We are a sustainable textile innovation company, which is super fancy. I love talking about Attitude because our co-founders created these really gorgeous, beautiful textiles. These are stunning fabrics, super soft, super silky. And we actually sell them as the D2C side for bedding. So we have bedding linens, we have uh, um, towels and bathrobes and really beautiful loungewear. Um, and we're really putting out new fabrics every year. And right now our current fabrics are made out of bamboo and they're just beautiful, beautiful. If you struggle with sleeping, like I cannot say enough good things about our bedding. But all of that being said, I actually started my career in data and analytics. I went to my undergrad for actuarial science, where I worked in the insurance world for a few years and absolutely hated it. So I pivoted over to data and analytics um, in marketing and really fell in love with the marketing world, wanted to be hands-on and went from kind of the data background into the performance marketing, growth marketing, where I was diving into SEM campaigns, I was diving into direct mail when direct mail was really big, um, and obviously now Facebook and social media, where I'm really ramping up you know, the growth of a company based on data and analytics. So I love what I do. I get really nerdy about uh, any sort of data and insights and marketing and creative. I love it all. So I'm super happy to be here and be talking about it. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, okay. Where do I begin? Uh, so performance marketing often uh, sometimes thrown around a little bit. I've heard it uh, the way you just described your role is how I would also describe that role. However, I've heard it as like, if you're a marketer, thus it's performance marketing, which I don't entirely agree with. Um, however, so at Attitude, not a small brand. You guys are clearly, uh, you know, well over the eight figure mark. So, or annually. So obviously you have to, you're probably working with some pretty good sized budgets. You've obviously got mm -hmm on a data to go through mm -hmm. but from a performance marketing side and from a data driven side, especially as you mentioned from a, a social media advertising side, that's a lot more of an art and a science than the SEM side. So how do you, how do you kind of look at the data that kind of involves the art aspect of that as well? That's such a good question. I feel like we have been diving into what is good for our brand this last year? And like, what is the visual and the creative and what do we want to put in front of our customers that like really resonates with us as attitude? Like, what does it mean for us as a brand? Um, and is that the best creative in general to put in front of an audience? Or are we only focused on saying like, buy these sheets now with these catchy bold colors and like, 
weird clickbaity. We shy away from all of the clickbaity stuff. There's so much marketing I think that you can do that entices people to buy, but it's like weird spammy marketing. Um, and I really encourage my team to shy away from that. Like at the end of the day, we know who we are at Attitude. We know what we like. We know what visuals resonate with us. Um, and that's who we want our audience to be. So we're really brand forward and brand focused and making sure that everything is through our brand lens of, you know, we want it to perform. We want things to have, you know, that revenue growth tied to them, but it still has to be attitude at the end of the day. So it is really hard to have that balance there to make sure that, you know, you're making everything look as good as we want it to be and then also have that revenue growth and that performance of it. Um, but we use a data attribution platform that we can just really dive into each of the creatives to see also how it impacts the customer journey as well. Like, is something more branded helping the customer come back to us, you know, maybe in a few weeks, maybe they're thinking about us later on and they're not buying right away, but they're coming back to us after they've done some research. And maybe they have a better lifetime value. So we're now using those data and insights to really drive that creative messaging and really figure out what attitude is when it comes to creative and put that in front of our best audience so we can merge that performance and that beauty of our brand. What um which data attribution tool are you using? I know there's several out there. Is it something you guys made custom? Oh, I would love if we could make something custom, but uh, yes. we are actually, <laughs> we are using uh, North Theme. Um, I feel like they're newer on the scene, but mm -hmm. we've really loved them so far. And their uh, attribution platform really learns with you and your data. So it's not like a one size fits all attribution model. It's actually like learning from your touch points and your customer behavior. Um, we also use Shopify and they integrate really well with Shopify, which I love. Yeah, it was, that was my next question because I know you guys are on Shopify, um, but tends to be on the attribution side. We get a lot of uh, sellers that are like, oh, we're on Triple Whale and then a handful that are on Hyros. And so it's already mm -hmm. Hyros. I think that's how you say it or Heroes. But uh, that's interesting. North Beam, I'll check that one out. I've heard that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of the things I, I wanted to ask you, because to have a... a, a your role, which is to me is like deep, deep data diving, obviously extremely necessary in my opinion for every business. Mm -hmm. However, in e-commerce, the, the thing that I always find very interesting, especially in your category is like you're in betting, right? Like yep. The way you explained it in the beginning was fantastic. And I immediately was like, okay, I got to reevaluate all of my betting, but that's a tough message to portray Oh, online yeah. if you can't feel the textile you can't like try it for a night like it, what so what are some of the tactics that you have to get over that initial hurdle of you know them wanting to try it before they do anything yeah to be honest this is something that i feel like everyone struggles with um as an online seller it is so hard when you're not having people touch something, um, maybe in the fashion world, it's try something on, which is what we saw with like our loungewear. Like people really want to experience fabrics and what they're purchasing to make sure that that's what they want to have at the end of the day. And for our betting, we actually offer a 30 night risk free trial. So all of your betting, like you can buy it, try it and we promise you that you'll love it and if you don't love it send it back to us um we are a sustainable focused company so i always kind of like caveat this with when you return your sheets to us it's not like they're going to the landfill like a lot of companies are we have re-commerce and reinvention programs in place like especially in australia you send our fabrics back to us we can donate them and create something for animal shelters. So at least those fabrics are going somewhere to like help dogs and help something else other than going in the landfill. So that's why I really love promoting our sleep trial is because it's kind of the best of both worlds. Nothing's getting thrown away, but if you don't like it, you don't like it. 
you send it back to us, but we promise you that you'll love it. So that's why we really stand by our trial so you can sleep in it. I think that sleep is such a hard thing for a lot of people. <laughs> I feel like most people say like, hey, I struggle with sleep. I don't wake up great in the morning. Um, and every single Attitude employee only sleeps on Attitude Sheets. Like we are 100% full force in love with what products we put out in the world, which makes it really fun to market to because <laughs> we're all obsessed with the product. Um, but it is very hard to put that information in front of people to have them feel justified to make that final purchase, mm -hmm. especially our price point is a little higher. So if you are really struggling to make that decision of like, yes, I'm going to buy these sheets versus going to a Target and maybe buying a $30 set of sheets, there's a lot of information that we have to put in front of you, which is why we brought on that attribution partner so we could see how these customer behaviors happen over time knowing that we introduce our product mostly on Facebook, we educate them on the website, we'll maybe re-educate them through YouTube or a TikTok video or something that's like a little bit more fun and engaging. Um, and then have you purchase, but have the, I guess like the background of this risk-free trial to really feel like you can jump into that purchase. But we do know there's a lot of touch points in our customer journey, which makes it really hard, but we're educating along the way. Nice. You mentioned a, a couple things there that I know I'm going to get a lot of questions about. So uh, paid advertising in general is mm -hmm. everyone's favorite thing to talk about because it's the easy, quick win, right? Like you spend yeah. the money, you make the money, that's it. It's not yeah. like SEO or just like traditional social that takes time. Like, it's not an investment in the future as well it is from a revenue standpoint, but it's it's like renting the space for now. So it's very quick yep. wins, right? So you mentioned that you're mostly, uh, it sounds like most of the top of funnel from an advertising perspective is from Facebook. And then you're re-educating them on other platforms. So are you only retargeting off uh, Facebook and Instagram or are you also doing more prospecting focused campaigns on other platforms? We are very prospecting focused, but do have all of those retargeting efforts in place. We also think when it comes to education, a lot really weighs on your email journeys and your welcome right. flows. So we have a very robust email program um, that we have one individual really focused on our retention, just like making sure that all of that information that you want to know about our products before and after you purchase is given to you. So that I think is very crucial to have in place um, even before you spend any ad dollars because that's pretty much your best retargeting program if you have a welcome flow that is before the purchase point um, if you're collecting an email uh, or anything like that. So we have that in place. We do have a lot of retargeting efforts, both on like Google, on Facebook, um, and then like prospecting across a ton of different, you know, social media channels. Mm -hmm. And um, Google as well is really good for us for prospecting. It's really hard. I feel like a lot of people are shopping directly through on Google now, um, as well as on Facebook. But with Google, I think people are just like a little bit more... I need this right now. <laughs> yeah. And it's a really interesting behavior. People like, I think are aspirational when they're on social, where they're thinking about like, oh, this would look great in my room. I should purchase this or this would look great on me. I should purchase this. Well, Google is more of a need of like, I need this thing right now or this is filling a need that I have. Um, that I need a replacement for. So we know that those behaviors are a little bit different, even though they're both prospecting audiences yeah. for us. Yeah, I always kind of put uh, Google almost as like you're actively going to a store to buy something. And then Facebook is kind of like when you go to Target and you walk out with 500 other things you didn't know you yes, needed. To yes. me, it's kind of like, you know, Google, they're actively looking for a solution to a problem that they know mm -hmm. they have. Whereas on Facebook, you're presenting them stuff 
that they may not have been thinking about at the time. So that's usually why I see like Love Facebook's that. cost per clicks might be lower, but the conversion rate is much lower. However, your Google, your cost per clicks higher, but your conversion rates also higher. So you kind of have to like weigh your two. Yeah. Um, but so uh, something else you had mentioned there about, you know, your welcome series and everything that you have after your, once actually someone converts, at least from an email, all of your advertising, I imagine from a social standpoint, at least, is it all with the goal of getting them to purchase? Or is there also, hey, we have some gated content of, you know, whatever, like maybe not an ebook or something like that, but something a lot, something downloadable just to get that email to put them in that flow? Right now, we don't have any of the gated content like the ebooks. Um, mm -hmm. But what we do is we have a few campaigns that we are driving just to that email welcome flow. Because we do educate not only about like our products, but our fabrics and like why bamboo is better as a fabric than cotton. And then having that explanation in a welcome flow. So we'll drive some like traffic audiences. And I feel like traffic when you're talking about campaigns on social media is such a like hated concept. I don't know. Like know. people seem so angry. I if it. I, if <laughs> I tell people that like we're driving traffic campaigns, like they lose their mind. I, I feel like people think that it's too expensive, but if you're putting something in front of your audience or you know that you're targeting the right group of people mm -hmm. that you can retarget them as an overall web visitors, I, I just don't see that this is something that we can lose on. And we have been running a traffic campaign for Facebook, driving to our email flow, just having them sign up and saying like, look, we're going to tell you all about our fabrics and like what you should expect. We'll give you a discount code, you know, just kind of like the basic stuff. And people sign up and people purchase at a great rate. So it's, I guess not a best practice, but it's something that we have found that is successful for us. So we just use that as an education point to get people in the door so we can like really drive that education home. Yeah. Oh, I love that you said that. Cause, okay. So we, we've done a bunch of traffic campaigns too. Right. And so my thought was, uh, you know, you had the iOS change, what, like mm -hmm. two or three years ago at this point or whatever it was. And what I realized was obviously everyone's doing lookalike audiences. Facebook's just leveraging your yeah. third party data. And I was like, all right, well, why don't we just use Facebook's first party data? If someone is going to click on something or they're going to watch a video, there's yeah. no limitation on the iOS there. Facebook knows it. So yeah. we actually did the same thing. We started doing a lot of traffic campaigns and uh, essentially just focused on, okay, let's make sure we have a really strong retargeting. If they're mm -hmm. watching the video or they're clicking, that's just another retargeting audience to work with. But those traffic campaigns, those cost per clicks are way lower than if you're targeting purchases or something. So it's kind of like, we don't even need to use as much budget. So I, I completely agree. I love that I'm not the only one doing that because otherwise I'm like, maybe I'm not doing this right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and there's so much data that for us, we're bringing them into, a, like I said, our welcome flow. We can actually track, you know, in Clavio, you can see those audience lists and know how many people are purchasing. So if you have that campaign split out in Facebook or whatever platform it is, say it's Pinterest, that you're driving traffic into your welcome flow, you have that welcome flow audience split out of like, this is our social media. You know your costs, you know your orders, you can back out that cost per order and make sure that it matches the rest of your goals. And if it doesn't, okay, then maybe that doesn't work for you and you can shut it off. But we tested this time and time again. And every time it came into a positive target for us, where it was like, there's no reason not to do this, even though people still like, I, I feel like I see a lot of content about marketing on Instagram and TikTok. And everyone's like, never run a traffic campaign. They're the worst kind of campaigns. I'm like, I don't think that's true. I think that you probably messed up on your targeting, whether or not like Facebook knew who you were going after. Maybe your targeting was too broad. Maybe it wasn't broad enough. And like you need to figure that out because I bet you anything it would work if you have an enticing like remarketing flow, like as we've been saying. So yeah, I love that someone agrees with this because this is a constant <laughs> battle. I'm like, no, 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 I'm sticking to my uh, targeting campaigns. Or my... It's funny that you say that because that's like, you know, all we do is marketing. So it's a running joke with us internally of finding these 
guru coach guys posting stuff on Instagram of like, don't read, don't do traffic or don't do this and don't do that. I'm like, that's not right. You're wrong. Yep. And that's yep. why you're selling courses and peddling your Instagram stuff. Um, but 100%. I digress. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned, um, you mentioned Pinterest, you mentioned TikTok. So obviously you guys have ventured out of the traditional mm -hmm. Facebook, Instagram stuff. When you're going into a new platform where you've got data, obviously from the Facebook, Instagram side on what's working and what's not, but you're still going into Pinterest, which obviously creative there is different. You go to TikTok, which is very different in mm -hmm. some cases. What What is your approach when you're going into a new platform on how to start that testing process? Oh, great question. I feel like there is so much time that our team takes of just like, step, like stepping back and being like, if I am browsing this, what would I want to see? And it's nice when, you know, you kind of are your target audience for the product or whatever you're selling. So I get that not everyone can do that. But at least for me, I can kind of sit back and look at let's say the Pinterest feed and say, this is me. I am our target audience. What would stand out to me? What would make me enticed to click on this or learn more or even remember and come back at a later date? Mm -hmm. So our team brainstorms a lot when we're talking about a new launch of like, what would we want to see? And really just leveraging both our creative team, brand team, um, and our other like marketers, paid marketers that we have just to say, what would we like to see? What would be enticing? I also heavily recommend leaning on a, like a rep for that platform if you have the opportunity to do so. I feel like right now a lot of companies are pulling back on ad spend. So most of these platforms are either offering like deals or specific like launch support. So if you need to harass like customer service at Pinterest or whatever it may be for three weeks before you get someone to answer you, you might want to do that because leveraging their team and just sitting down with them to say, this is the audience I have. This is the campaign set up. These are the creatives. What are your thoughts uh, before you go live? I think is such a valuable tool to have that I always have all of our reps double check everything before we launch it because they see everything. Like they know the ins and outs of a new launch. So we really rely heavily on those reps to make sure that we're doing the best practices and then also just coordinating within our team. But also like a big part of it for us as we're kind of a smaller team, I report directly to our co-founders. I want to make sure that our co-founders are really in on this and like have buy-in and support us. So mm -hmm. I'll say like, we need to make sure that we have $10,000 of budget set aside for Pinterest testing this month. And we may lose absolutely all of it and get nothing back. But that is the risk that we want to take because we want to have enough data to see what the actual outcome was. And sometimes with our like latency, We'll run something for a month, pause it, wait to see if anything else came through in that latency time period, do our final recap of how it performed, and then determine whether or not this should be an evergreen or always on campaign, understanding that latency and how it impacts the rest of our channels, which again, going back to those data tools are such a valuable thing to have so you can follow that customer journey. But I just, I personally really enjoy having the buy-in of all of our team to make sure that that's a space we want to be in and that's exactly how we want to promote our brand. Um, but I do say it's a little easy for me because I am the person that I am trying to target. <laughs> yeah. I, I loved hearing you say all of that because it, it's a it's a common thing that we hear with other sellers when we're working with them of testing out a new platform. First, your reference of, you know, putting 10,000 aside and saying you may get nothing. I'm also yep. a very conservative person with everything in my business. And I always go into something saying I'm spending this expecting zero except yep. data. And then yep. I'm just going to see what happens. And that's I, I love that, you know, that's your same approach because 
the other side of that too is if you start that budget too low on a new platform, it's going to take you that much longer to figure out if it's working. You basically have to go in with like a buy-in of, okay, we're going to test out this platform. It's going to cost me this and I may get nothing, but I'm going to learn whether it's going to even have a chance or not. So I yeah. love, love that approach. Yeah. I'll give a little example here of we ran Pinterest ads during Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Mm-hmm. We were like in the week and we were like launching a whole bunch of stuff. And I was like, let's just pop something up on Pinterest. I'm really curious whether or not this will work for us. So we threw something up on Pinterest for ads. They performed well. They hit our target CPO that we went after. And we had a lot of questions from the rest of our team of like, after Black Friday, Cyber Monday, we shut off the ads. And everyone was like, well, we know that that works. Like, why aren't we really continuing to run it? And I was like, there's two things here. One, we know that seasonality dips right after Black Friday. Oh, yeah. If someone bought something, they're not buying really the first, like, two weeks of December. So I was like, kind of want to pull back on everything anyway. So that's the first thing. But I was like, Black Friday, Cyber Monday is a totally different deal Uh, than the rest of the year. I was like, we, you know, we have proven that this is a good sales channel for us, potentially. And I was like, even that has like a caveat on it of like, Labor Day might perform poorly in comparison, just because there's, you know, less people in the middle of that shopping behavior. So even though we technically tested something that had this huge success for us, it was a huge success in such a small area. And I was like, this doesn't really relate to Evergreen. We're going to have to retest it. We're going to have to see what that seasonality is like for that platform throughout the year. Um, so I feel like sometimes my team thinks that I'm such a downer when it comes to testing <laughs> because all of our, uh, recaps when it comes to a new platform, I'm like, yes, this is great, but X, Y, Z, here are all of the reasons why this data is like this. So we can remember that and put that into further testing because I promise you there is nothing worse than saying something is successful for you and going full speed into that thing when you haven't had the proper testing and it will just bomb. And then everyone is asking questions of like, what did you do? How did you not know <laughs> this? this? And like, fault. yeah, this is your fault now. And it's like, okay, you really got to think of all of the reasons why your test was winning before you can say, this is something that we fully want to roll out. And it kind of does make you seem like a downer when you're having those yeah, conversations all the time. The whole thing. <laughs> but I love having like those conversations because I'm like, look, you're thinking about all of the outcomes. You're constantly testing and learning to make sure that you're always doing what's best for the company and nothing is just a given of like, oh, we should always be there. You should always be considering why you're there and like whether or not that channel continues to perform within seasonality, within changes in brand. Um, there's so many different changes that your company goes through. So it feels like you just have to continue testing and learning and really stick with that mentality. I agree. Chelsea, thank you so much for that. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, that was that was everything I was hoping it would be. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd love to uh, give you the opportunity here to let everyone know where they can find out more about you and obviously more about Attitude. Yeah, absolutely. You should go to attitude.com and check out our wonderful products. That is E-T-T-I-T-U-D-E.com. It's Eco Attitude, if that helps you remember. Um, but definitely please come to our website. If you want to email me, it's chelsea at attitude.com and you can find me on LinkedIn at Chelsea Schultz. Perfect. Chelsea, thank you so much for being on the show. Obviously, everyone who tuned in, thank you as well. You know the usual drill, rate, review, subscribe, all that fun stuff on whichever podcast platform you want or head over to the ecomshow.com, watch all of our previous episodes or listen to them, whatever you prefer. But as usual, thank you all for joining us and we'll see you all next time. Have a good one. Thank you for tuning in to the Ecom Show. Head over to ecomshow.com to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or on the Blue Tusker YouTube channel. The Ecom Show is brought to you by Blue Tusker. 
a full-service digital marketing company specifically for e-commerce sellers looking to accelerate their growth. Go to bluetusker.com now for more information. Make sure to tune in next week for another amazing episode of The Ecom Show.